you weren't put on this earth to live life small. I believe that you, Michael, me, everybody, you have a certain set, set of gifts, talents, and interests. And your job is to take those things that are interesting to you and now put value into the world. That's Ben Glass, founder and CEO of Great Legal Marketing and Ben Glass Law. So I'm a pure laissez-faire capitalist, but people who don't understand capitalism, you know, or call it evil, like they forget that it begins with the premise of, I have to earn my way in this world by putting value into the world first, make somebody else's life better first, and then I will be compensated for that. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Ben Glass to discuss what it means to live life big, the mindset required to achieve entrepreneurial freedom, and the importance of building an organization of A players. The best benefit that we can give to a team member is to hire other great team members that they like to come to work on Monday and work with. That's like the best thing. And every time a business owner and a lawyer tolerates non-superstars, and you can go through a fix-it program, right? But if you tolerate that, you're saying to the rest of the team, I don't respect you. I'm not really concerned about making you better. And I'm not concerned about making this the best place you'll ever work. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Before we begin today's episode, I want to remind you that we aren't beholden to any sponsors or run any ads on this podcast. This allows us to present all of our episodes raw and unfiltered. I'm not going to push any made-to-order meal services on you or try to save you any money on your car insurance. That being said, I have one small request. If you receive any value from this podcast, please give it a five-star review. Pay the fee so we can keep this podcast free. Ben, welcome to the podcast. It's going to be fun, my friend. We haven't spoken in a while, and it's it's good to catch up with you. I know. So this has been a long time coming because I think the people listening are going to be in for a treat. And I want to read out like a short bio in the sense that you know, you're a nationally recognized plaintiff's attorney, the owner of Ben Glass Law, the author of 14 books, and the founder and CEO of Great Legal Marketing. So is it really 14 books? It's probably more by now. I mean, so last year I, I authored a book for teenage soccer referees. It's a mindset book for the youngins to get through their first season when someone who's not their mom, their dad, their coach or their teacher is screaming at them. Um, so a lot of those books were books for the practice to promote the practice, promote various niches. I've written three into the solo and small firm space. I've got a book we give away all over the place in Northern Virginia. It's, it's the uh, Live Life Big Journal, which really is a collection of thoughts. Like you, I'm a big journaler or journalist. All my clients are sick or injured, and so we've created something motivational for them. So it's probably a little bit more than that now. So I want to get to a lot of this, but oftentimes I want to take things back to the beginning. So from what I've read, you grew up as the oldest of seven children. And I'm always curious, like, how do people become who they are? Why are they the way that they are? And oftentimes you find that much of it has to do with you know their experience growing up as children and just their upbringing. If you could speak to some of that. Yeah, so I was blessed and recently, just this past weekend, my siblings, six siblings and I were together for one of my brother's birthday and we, and we took a big family picture. And like, we were so lucky. We grew up in Northern Virginia in the 60s. Uh, I graduated in high school in 76, right? To give folks a frame of reference in a neighborhood that was filled with kids. My dad was an electrical engineer. He was not entrepreneurial, but he was an electrical engineer and coached us. My mom was a stay-at-home mom and she worked where she came down and volunteered at the Catholic school we all went to, you know, the playground lady and the cafeteria mom. And our neighborhood was filled with 
sports and kickball and soccer. My next door neighbor actually uh, was Scott Norwood, who played for the Buffalo Bills. His dad was a professional baseball player. His his brother was a, made it to the minor leagues in baseball. And so it was almost all sports all the time. I happened to be a decent soccer player and, and was fortunate enough, Michael, to play with really good players. So at the high school and the club and then the collegiate level, I get to play at a very high level and really had a, had a run there. We were not poor and we were not rich. Our parents loved us. And so I had a very traditional path. The one thing I think is I'm very blessed is at 16, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And that sounded like a cool way solve problems. I was kind of a rules guy, which is how I got into refereeing. So I played soccer in college at William Mary on scholarship. I went to law school, to a law school that is now very famous and hard to get into, George Mason University or Antonin Scalia School of Law. But it was a startup. I mean, it, it literally was in its first month of ABA accreditation. Was fortunate to get out and to work for three trial lawyers who were doing it in the beginning, insurance defense work. So they let me get involved and I got to try a lot of cases as they were transitioning their practice into a plaintiff's practice. I then got to try plaintiff's cases and I was, you know, decent at it, getting uh, juries and judgments and, you know, settlements and stuff like that, but growing the family. So we ended up nine children. (laughs) We can talk about that. But at that time I had five and I was coaching at one point three soccer teams. Uh, at the same time. <laughs> and that commute was like Atlanta. It's the Northern Virginia irregular. You have no idea how long it's actually going to take. And so I wanted to be able to coach. And it was at that point where I was a good lawyer. And I thought, well, how hard could it be to start a law firm? So I left that firm, started my own practice, me and an assistant, thousand square feet in an office building and started to go from there. And over those next 18 months, Michael, that I learned I really didn't know anything. I mean, I knew I knew all the lawyer stuff. I could hammer well, but I couldn't architect and build. And so I started to seek advice, mainly outside of the legal profession, as to how to build a business. That was that journey. And here we are today, so 2023, the law firm has got about 16, 17 under roof. We've got four lawyers. We only do two things. So we do personal injury, car crash cases in Virginia. I do long-term disability cases and and consults all over the country, mainly for high wage earners who have complex lives. That's all we really know, but we're good at it and we make good money. and, And importantly, we've built great teams. As you know, I built also great legal marketing, which started about 10 years after I started my practice. Teaching at the very beginning, Michael, was teaching personal injury lawyers how to advertise better. That's where it started. Today, we coach, we coach the lawyers, Michael, that are in the sort of 500K revenue up to maybe $5 million revenue. You know, you can solve the marketing problem. It's relatively easy and formulaic if you know what to do. But then we take those lawyers into the things that you and I, you know, work on all the time, which is how do you build team? How do you build culture? How do you grow? How do you hire the right people? How do you make it so that you and I can not be the ones getting on airplanes, right? We talked before we went live here. And so it's an interesting journey. I'm, I'll be 65 next month. I'm always problem solving. And the problems I solve today are are just more interesting, I think, than the problems I solved when I started my practice. They're both big relative to where the business is. I'm blessed to have a very interesting life to live. So, so, but you're very good at this. That, we've got a lot to unpack with what you just shared. <laughs> yeah, I know, like, sorry. I, I, you know, so I want to start with the sports because it seems like yeah. sports and particularly soccer have played a very important role in your life. And I once heard you state that playing sports builds character and it can build good character and, and bad character if you could elaborate on that. So there's a bunch from sports. So the title of one of my books is called Play Left Fullback. And that is from my dad's advice as we were going out to trout for my first travel soccer team. I was 12 years old. He says, tell the coach you play left fullback. I'm like, I'm not a defender. I'm not left footed and I've never played left fullback. Like, why would I do that? He said, you want to you want to show up differently. No one else is going to want to play that position and you want to get in the team. So get in the team first. We'll figure out the rest later. And that's great business advice. Like, How do we show up in a room with people who are better than we are and then learn to go to play to their level. The second thing, so what I spend a lot of time in today, so I still referee at the high school boys and girls level and like U19 and down boys and girls. And I'm known kind of nationally a little bit for the referees, sportsmanship guys. I'm one of those people that if you're acting up, I will take your video. I will put it on YouTube and I will shame you into never showing up again at your kid's game and making a jerk out of yourself. And so we've got some videos that have literally tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand views of bad parents out there. So I'm a real advocate 
for that. And I stay refereeing because A, it's a fitness thing, but B, it's a psychological, it's an interesting psychological exercise in a stadium with a crowd, national anthem, rivalry, boys or girls, it doesn't matter anymore because they're both challenging. And how do you manage that game? How do you train for the game? And how do you recover from the game? Those are things that are interesting. I'll tell you a quick story. Years ago, I was at a tournament as a parent, and I'm the guy who's sitting off from the other families, right? And in the restaurant later, one of the moms says, how can you sit so calmly? Like our team was playing in a semifinal and it was anxious and people are screaming. And I said to her, I said, hey, when you're the dad to nine and you've played your whole life. So I've been involved in probably 2,500 games as a player, coach, referee, or parent. None of it matters on Monday. It doesn't matter what happens on the weekend. The kids aren't going to remember it. So it's not that big a deal that we win or we lose on this term. Now, I wasn't always that way, admittedly, right? But I learned it and I try to teach sports is important. It does can create character. Pick your coach. Pick your kid's coach, not the club, not the team. What's the character of the coach? Because that will drive. And remember that none of this matters the next day. Let the kids have fun. That You got me on a rant now. <laughs> I have different realms in my life that are important. So CrossFit, refereeing, church, law firm, coaching company. It's really hard to have a bad day when you're me because everything would have to be bad. And there's always something good. Most of it is usually good, actually. And so when you have interests outside of just being a lawyer, right, that's real important. It's real important to the profession that we have things that are interesting to us that we like doing. You've talked a lot about like living life big. And I'd, I'd love to hear like what, what you mean by that. Is that like a work life balance thing or is that just going all the way into different facets of your life? Here, here's what we say. Brian and I, my son, Brian and I have built, a, we believe to be a perfect practice. For us, we get to do work that we like doing and we're good at with people that we like for clients that we like. Now, if you ask any lawyer, like, would that be a cool combination? Yes, it's really cool. So you weren't put on this earth to live life small. I believe that you, Michael, me, everybody, you have a certain set, set of gifts, talents, and interests. And your job is to take those things that are interesting to you and now put value into the world. So I'm a pure laissez-faire capitalist, but people who don't understand capitalism, you know, or call it evil, like they forget it. it begins with the premise of, I have to earn my way in this world by putting value into the world first, make somebody else's life better first, and then I will be compensated for that. You know, my superpower, Michael, is working with anybody, lawyer, kiddo thinking about going to law school and helping them see their own beauty, their own uniqueness, and encouraging them to appreciate that and to put that into the world bravely with courage, even when there are detractors, even when you are a renegade. You know, the average person, I don't think, is brave enough to live this way most of the time. It creates controversy, it creates enemies, but I don't care. I'm living a life that's really happy for me. I don't violate anybody else's rights, but I do try. If I'm working with you, someone on your team, someone you know in our church, like I'm trying to make your life better just by helping you find like, what's the next thing I can do to be happy, to be productive? And then to, to dial that back, I'm curious, was there any type of catalyst or some moment in your life that kind of influenced you to be this way? I mean, I imagine that you didn't come out of the womb this way. But today, you know, obviously, it's very important for you to work with people that you like, whether it's clients, team members. You're very, very clear in terms of lifestyle design. I think it's one of the very first things you do, even with your coaching clients. But I'm just wondering, like, was there some moment in your life that just for was sure. the catalyst behind that? Yeah, for sure. Because again, I had a very, you know, I was, I was raised by a, a great parents, but they weren't entrepreneurial. And we didn't talk a lot about this philosophy of living when we were uh, young. And law school doesn't teach you anything at all, hardly prepares you for the practice of law, let alone, you know, life in the fast lane. So it was when I had my own practice, and I didn't understand how to run a business. And every lawyer I talked to didn't understand how to run a business either. And I had to go outside the legal industry and I started hanging with entrepreneurs and I wanted to know a couple of things like, all right, how'd you build your business? All right, your business is different, but I also want to know, and I still today, like, how do you think, how does Mike Mogul think? 
How do you, who do you read? Who do you listen to? Who are you inspired by? Who do you reject as crazy? And so I started asking entrepreneurs that. And I found that a lot of them think the way I just described, I believe I think, and they encouraged me to, to be courageous. I didn't have to live the life that the legal profession tells you you have to, which is putting the client tops and you're the self-sacrificial lamb to the client, which I think is wrong. You go top, your family is right next to you, your team is right below them. And if all of that is true, 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 then the client will be well served, right? Working for people you like, like we don't deal with clients who we don't like. And that is a major source of lawyer unhappiness in the country. So it was it was hanging with entrepreneurs, Michael. And Dan Kennedy was a huge influence. He introduced me to Ayn Rand and Atlas Shrugged. I have a whole bookshelf of materials pro and con about the philosophy of living in capitalism and can discuss that with anybody. And that changed the way I look at the world with boldness. And the, you know, the world needs leaders. And the thing is, leaders don't, shouldn't wait to be asked to lead. Uh, and that sounds arrogant if you're not, if you don't know Ben, and you don't know Michael, and we say that, it sounds arrogant and weird, okay? But stick with us, hang around us for a little bit And you'll see that what you and I do in the world is we help other people live their very best life. No matter what they choose that to be, as long as they're not robbing banks, not to steal from people, but to put value into the world. Yeah. And and to your point, when you were sharing that law school is not preparing lawyers for the practice of law, I know much of what you've done has been rejecting the status quo. But for the majority of lawyers in America that that open up a law practice, you know, we had uh, Brian Cuban on the podcast, like I think it was last year, even the year before. And he was talking about the high incidence of anxiety and depression in the legal profession. Why do you think that is like what perpetuates that? Is it just lawyers being type A or what is it? I'll tell you what perpetuates that for sure. It's the elite in the legal profession. So I just had an article published in the uh, Journal of the Virginia State Bar, like the official elite journal. And I was responding to an article. To, so all over the country, Michael, there's this lawyer wellness initiative. And the lawyer wellness initiative, every single one of those articles begins with this life sucks. Too bad. That's what you chose. And I'm like, why do you keep telling people that the default is this life is horrible? That's what perpetuates it. Let's, so let's start right there. But the profession's answer to this, we're going to teach you how to meditate. We're going to teach you how to eat better. We're going to teach you how to pet kitty cats. I'm like, BS. Like, how? why don't we start with you get to create the practice that you want to create that fulfills the life you want to create. So it's your life first. Create the practice that you want. Okay, who's the client? Now let's talk about what you and I do is teach advertising and marketing and stuff like that, right? But that's down the list after we pick life first. And so the profession, the elites of the profession are the ones perpetuating this mess. And there's nobody out there because if Ben Glass shows up at a Virginia State Bar convention or something, the elites run screaming because I say things they don't even know. Like they don't even know how to say this. And I'm really upsetting the status quo because... By and large, the legal profession is about feeding big law, right? And big law really is like you're working two jobs. Like, hey, congratulations, we're going to pay you this six-figure salary to work 80 plus hours a week. That's two jobs. <laughs> yeah. But it's, you know, it's interesting to me. I mean, what, would it not make sense to have a profession where people are healthy, like mentally, physically, they're engaged, they're able to make a great impact? Like, would that not be good if you're just a profession overall? I, yes, I do. I do things. But, but the other thing that kind of holds lawyers back or makes this challenging is that we are, you know, finders of issues. If you're a litigator, right, you are against someone else who's saying your ideas are wrong or stupid or whatever. And so lawyers tend to unfortunately be the ones who look at the things that can go wrong. Now, I'm a litigator. My son is a litigator. We built a great litigation practice. And we're really happy. I mean, we get to walk around in you know t-shirts and jeans most of the time, and our clients are really happy. And that really is the standard. Ben's happy, the team's happy, and the clients are happy. So nobody else's opinion about how we do this matters to me, <laughs> or to Brian actually. And uh, our clients are, are really well served. And as lawyers who listen to you, listen to me, listen to other thought leaders here, get better at what we teach, what you and I teach, they build better practices, they serve more people better, and the lawyer stays sane, right? Because 
it does us no good if the if the client wins their case, but the lawyer is so burned out he or she wants to quit the profession. Like that's not good for the world. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's interesting because I think most entrepreneurs, if you ask them, like, what is it that you really want? And you ask enough why questions, it usually comes back to some sort of freedom, right? Freedom in terms of how they spend their time, who they spend their time with, what it is that they're doing and so on. And it, a lot of this involves a lot of mindset shifts. I'm, I'm curious if you could speak to just in your experience over the years, and even with working with other firm owners, what do you find are kind of the biggest mindset shifts that firm owners have to make to get on this path? First is getting over the guilt that you are made to feel if you're going to put your own life first. Like, that's not the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to, there's a letter to the editor that follows my article, like in the next issue, commenting on my article that says, hey, I was just at the bar initiation ceremony for new lawyers, and they told us this life sucks. I mean, that was their main message. So getting over the guilt of feeling like you can make money, you can have time, freedom, and the clients will be well served, I think is the biggest thing because nothing that you or I teach about marketing matters in my view if the lawyer can't accept that he or she is entitled, is entitled to earn, let me say, is entitled to earn a life where they get to make all the decisions as to who to serve and when to serve them. And then the other thing is the mindset shift is all of the answers aren't in legal. Very few of the answers are in legal. I got to go ask the hair salon owner and the car dealership and maybe the guy or gal who's selling coaching to dentists or CPAs or whatever. Like Again, how do you do this? How do you think? What, what platforms do you use? And most lawyers, I think, are they certainly are not directed by the established bar to go look outside of legal to how to make your life better. They're just not. And so you go to a, a crisp event, right? That world is it's a different galaxy <laughs> from a Virginia State bar or even a trial lawyer, call it a business event in Virginia. God bless them. They do a good job teaching lawyers how to be better deposition takers. But Michael, the, the people that come to your thing are aliens compared to most lawyers. And what I see happening is more and more lawyers, good for them, are showing up. Lawyers need to be in those rooms. It's still only a tiny percentage of lawyers in America who have even discovered this world that you and I live in. And that's what you and I are trying to change. Like, let us just show you what's behind this curtain but at least come look at what's going on at this side of the universe. And I think it was, so if we look at number of lawyers in America, I think it's what, 1.3 million. If you look at number of law firms in America, it's several hundred thousand. And I believe Thomson Reuters did a study on the average annual, like gross revenue of your typical small law firm. And it came out to, I think about 140,000 gross. And when you look at that number, this is before like any overheads have been paid, any technology, yeah. software costs, any marketing costs, internet, like all of these things. And you look at that number and you think, man, that's not worth it, right? If you're going to start a law firm, you have to embrace the idea of capitalism, which nowadays, I know you hinted at it, is being somewhat demonized. I cannot understand why. Do you, do you understand why? Well, now I was just listening to a book on Audible about Jack Welch, and it's written by a New York Times reporter. And in the whole fir the whole preface paragraph, the guy either other either doesn't understand or hates capitalism, hates America. Now he's writing a book about Welch. You know, so why why is that? Now we can get philosophical. If people sat down and actually took the time to listen to what we're to what we're talking about, which is capitalism is you and I creating win-win relationships. No force or fraud. I'm not going to cheat you. You and I are trying to make one plus one equal five by doing something, to, by entering a relationship together. I sell you an iPhone. You feel you're better off because you have the iPhone. I feel I'm better off because I have the money. That was how Apple was built. That's capitalism, right? So capitalism is not Liars, cheaters, and stealers, right? Like we are all against cheaters. I create a business and you want to come work here? Well, you have to work to my standards. Here's the pay I offer, right? I wasn't created just to make jobs. I was created to make me happy first. One of the things that we're good at here, Michael, is if you come here, and I got this in part from you at a conference that you were at with us, is I'm going to make you better. In fact, I'm going to make you so good that you could go and compete with me but if I do my job right, you won't want to. Like I'll build a culture here so good that you would not want to go even though you could. Because as you said, when you spoke several years ago, like what happens if they don't get better in five years? <laughs> That's a horrible place to be. 
Yeah. And, and look, I'll, I'll also say that, you know, when you look at all this, even profit is demonized, but you would think that if you've got to make it worth it for the business owner. I always think about that because if I come across somebody, let's say it's a law firm owner and they're exhausted and they're not making any money and they're frustrated and they just literally hate the world, you think, well, that's not worth it, right? So you would think that if you could grow your organization in a way where by you know growing more revenue, now you're able to invest more in your team. You could hire, you can create additional jobs, you can support your community at a higher level. All these things are good things. I agree with you 100%. I just, I think it ultimately at the end of the day has to make sense for the person taking all the risk. It does, but it's but also, you know, there's an ethical thing here too, which is if you're taking on, say, a plaintiff's case and you are underfunded and you can't pay the rent and you can't pay the lights, well, are you going to like go out and get the best experts? Are you going to get the best exhibits? Are you going to get the best technology? We have this ethical obligation to be able to provide this, not just the same level of lawyer expertise, but for particular cases to provide all of the right technology for the case. And so, yeah, lawyers who make more money and are happier are going to, almost by definition, they're going to end up getting a better result for the client because it's the stressed out lawyer who's worried about whether the lights are going to turn on on Monday. Like, how is he or she going to write the best brief over the weekend? It doesn't work that way. So you and I are in agreement that this is about win-win and the client wins. Like the world wins when two people get together and figure out how to trade value for value. Yes. And and making money and being a great lawyer are not mutually exclusive things. In fact, I think you and I both argue that those are inclusive of one another. I want to shift gears slightly. I know you mentioned early on in solving like the marketing problem, because I know and it's so funny. We've had such such strong parallels because I think when somebody's starting out, they're trying to figure out how to get the phone to ring. So all they're interested in hearing about is marketing, which I think you and I at this point say, well, that's not the most interesting problem to solve. I mean, yes, you need to solve it. The phone needs to ring. But it's like after you solve that problem, that's when things get really interesting. The marketing and advertising problem is a How do I show up differently? So if I'm going to play in the pond of TV advertising, just to use that as a media example, I better show up differently from all the other people, especially because most of the other people are going to have more money than I am. So I choose the pond, the media pond I'm going to play in, and then I better show up differently. So many of the lawyers that I coach, and certainly we have been good at that, is we play in the pond of grassroots marketing, of being the best personal injury lawyer at our CrossFit gym, of supporting the local community, of being famous, famous soccer referee who improves the sportsmanship. That's a place where Brian and I love to play because we're not going to go compete against, I mean, the DC market, right? Against the, the lawyers who are spending literally millions of dollars a month on TV advertising. Those aren't our clients, frankly, and that's not the problem we're playing. So, so it's figuring out how do I show up differently? Number two, we spend all this money to generate a call or a web fill or whatever, and then Sally can't answer the phone. I don't have a dedicated phone answerer with a script who can sell the practice, who can sell the idea that you've made a great decision, Michael, to call Ben Glass Law. And so lawyers, they skip over that part completely. They wonder, how come my website isn't working? Well, gee, I I tried to refer a big case out to a, a state out in the Midwest, filled out their web form, heard nothing. Big firm. Famous lawyers, I call them, I got voicemail. Hey, leave your message, we'll get back to you. I'm like, what are you doing? How can this be in 2023? Again, it takes some work, but there's well-established processes for getting more leads and then getting the leads to convert once they call. Especially in 2023, big challenge is building the team, like hiring, retention, right? People talk about all the millennials, whatever, you know, don't want to work, which I think is BS, right? When Brian and I thought deeply about this a couple of years ago, and we thought, well, why do we even exist? Why are we taking this risk? And we we batted around, Michael, the traditional lawyer thought for justice, to get clients the money they deserve, all that. We said, no, no, no. We actually run this place to build a place where people will thrive, okay? Because we want to have an organization, again, where the owners will thrive, where it's worth the risk and it's fun for us. Number two, where the team thrives. So the best benefit that we can give to a team member is to hire other great team members that they like to come to work on Monday and work with. That's like the best thing. And every time a business owner and a lawyer tolerates non-superstars, and you can go through a fix-it program, right? But if you tolerate that, you're saying to the rest of the team, I don't respect you. 
I'm not really concerned about making you better, and I'm not concerned about making this the best place you'll ever work. So just think about that. And we tolerate stuff out of fear that there's no one else out there who want to come. And that's wrong. You build a place with great culture, your team's out recruiting. Like, I want you to be so good you could leave and compete with me, but you want to stay and you want to go bring some friends over. And every time our paralegals, Michael, go out to paralegal events, those rooms are filled with miserable people. I mean, people who are miserable because of the workplace, not they're miserable people, but they hate their job. They hate the people they work with. Like, come on over here. <laughs> and that's the harder, frankly, the harder skill because you have to be a, a human being who knows how to communicate you have to not just put core values on the wall. You have to live core values every day. You have to treat people the way you are asking them to treat others because it's just like when you're, you're a parent, you've got little ones, right? Yours are young, but if you tell your kiddos, it, girl, two girls? Yep, a four-year-old yeah, and you a tell, uh, two-year-old. Yeah, so they get a little bit older and you tell them one thing and they watch you and your wife do something different to treat the barista unkindly, to get mad at the person who's driving down the road, they're like, well, mom and dad don't really believe what they're saying. Those are soft skills, but the lawyers who I know who are attracting good talent, even in this talent thin world, I, I got lawyers in, in our groups who are, have, are building great teams and the people stay, right? It's because they're living, those lawyers are living authentic, value-ridden, principle-driven lives. Again, they don't teach you this in law school. You can't go to one seminar and learn and listen to Tony Robbins once and listen, but you listen to these people and read these books of, of people who have built great businesses. This is the secret. It's the people, everything else becomes easier. Yep. Yep. And I, and I say this even as a reformed marketer in many ways, because even my first book, which I'm very fortunate you, you wrote a blurb for, it was a marketing book, The Game Changing Attorney. And now, because yeah. I've been in the process of writing the second book, I agree wholeheartedly. I would say that most people, most firm owners do not have a marketing problem. I mean, I think they believe they do. They think if I could only get more leads, more calls or whatever it is, my life would improve. But usually the same person who's saying that is working 60 to 80 hours a week, right? They're already spread thinly. They're exhausted. So the phone ringing more does not necessarily solve any of those problems. If anything, it creates more work for them. And in fact, if it was approached the opposite way of saying, hey, let's get our organization right. Let's make sure that I have the capacity, the support that we need. Let's bring on the capabilities that we need from team members and so on. Let's actually get, you know, just let me get the help and support and then we can pour gasoline with the marketing. But I have rarely ever seen marketing as a solution to all the law firm's problems. No, you're exactly right. It can be a problem, A, because you're wasting money because you don't, haven't given deep thought. You, you know, you hand over your credit card to a, a marketing agency without really understanding marketing. You can burn a lot of money that way. Then you burn it because the leads do come in, but you don't have a process and people to deal with the leads. And then if all you're going to do is stress out your paralegals because you just added, you know, 10 more cases to their file and, and you haven't trained them and you haven't hired for the next one, then you're just creating a cesspool. Look, that's why A, this profession, this industry is, is fun and interesting because there are always things to try to figure out. And, I, and again, I think lawyers need to be in rooms of people who are talking not just about marketing and not just about how to take a deposition for sure, but how to build a business, how to build a team, how to build, a, you know, they say I build a legacy. And I, th I think this is true, like something that can live beyond Ben's interest in practicing law, but I'll be here for a long time because I actually like what I'm doing. It's a minuscule percentage of lawyers who are today interested in that. And yet I think that's the golden key to happiness. So I want to talk about something that I know is, is a hot button for you. I, I think you did a podcast on this. And I remember right after I listened to it and I shot you a text. I'm like, Ben, you got to come on the podcast. There's a lot of great organizations out there. But how much of the responsibility falls on the firm owner, meaning for them to do the work, for them to have the commitment, for them to execute within their own law firm to see the results they want to see? So for all you listeners out there, wherever you are today is a direct result of all the decisions you've made and where you'll be in five years or 12 months from now is a direct result of the decisions and actions that you make, right? All of the folks that I mentioned on the podcast, and I apologize if, if you're out there and I didn't mention your name, that's no disrespect to any of these other thought leaders, but what we are teaching is not rocket science, but lawyers lead busy lives. And so we have to teach in a way that motivates and excites you to spend some part of your busy life 
learning what other people have learned about business and management and people management. And then again, being in a room, a mastermind group, a, a seminar, a lot of, lo there's a ton of mastermind groups. My wife asked me, you know, she says, is this like a new thing? I said, well, Napoleon Hill wrote about it like a hundred years ago, but it's relatively new to the legal profession. And so finding out like who else is in the room that you're being invited to join, that's probably even more important than who's leading the room, frankly, because what a leader of a mastermind group does, Michael, is he or she assembles a great mastermind group. That's, that's like a little secret there. So it's 100% your responsibility to, to sort of guarantee your success. I would have to answer your phone. I would have to process the cases for you or monitor that. I would have to make sure that you are taking care of your clients, not just talking to them about their cases, but asking them about their lives. Because it takes all that. It's like golf. Like I tried golf after four kids. Now we have nine, but we were done. And like, you got to be good. I don't know if you play golf or not, but you got to be good at a lot of different things. And I enjoyed going out in the mornings by myself because I was never very good. I did not like playing with other players who moaned and groaned about the whole, you know, four hours on a beautiful golf course and they're moaning the whole time. But you had to be good at a lot of different things. And that's the same with running a business. Now you can, you can buy expertise, like you can get COOs in, you can get a CEO in, you can get business coaches. We all... Uh, you know, I have several <laughs> business coaches and I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars over my career on my own education and my own uh, getting coaches to coach both me individually, Ben, mindset, and also leadership teams at my two organizations. That has been, it, talk about game changer, like invaluable game changer um, stuff. But you're responsible for your own success. All anybody can do is show you here are ideas and here's things we know work. Here's things we think don't work. Put two and two together and we're going to have a third idea. I mean, that's the value of a mastermind group. The other value of a mastermind group is you have accountability. It's like if you got a meeting in April, you better show up having done something, right? Don't just come, sit, listen, and do nothing. That You're wasting your time and money and you're wasting the time of your fellow mastermind members. Obviously, having worked with you know so many firm owners, how can you tell the difference between the ones that like the idea of success versus the ones that are actually committed to doing the work? The ones who are committed will be engaged and curious when we have e either a big event, but more importantly, when we have a small group, either small group event or small group mastermind. The ones who talk about success but aren't really serious about it, they'll be the number one complainers in your group. This didn't work for me. You told me to do a newsletter. This didn't work for me. Oh, let me see your newsletter. Oh, your newsletter is boring. Like you, you don't follow any of the quote rules of a print newsletter. They're the ones who will talk badly about their staff. Oh, well, who hired them? Who kept them? Like, why are they still there if they're so horrible? They're the ones who tend to talk badly about other lawyers. I find that that the lawyers who are successful in business, you know, they have this abundance mentality and, and they they have, you know, their their list of people that they don't like is very, very, very small. And you can tell, you know, you go to other events and every time they talk about another lawyer or a judge, they're always negative. That person is not going to be a good member for me. It's not going to be a good a member or customer for you. We want people who like the world, who like people and who are just curious. I mean, that's, you know, one of the core values. Like, are you curious? Are you are you humble enough to be able to say what you don't know and really to, to ask people? You know, I was telling your assistant there, the secret reason that you and I do podcasts is because we get to interview people that we would like to talk to for an hour and get coaching. <laughs> and so that's why your podcast is so good because you're asking, you're always asking curious questions, usually because you want to know something, right? And if you want to know it, there's a lot of, there's thousands of other lawyers around the country who want to know it, right? So there, now we're going to have like 15 or 20 more podcast creators. Every lawyer I know, Michael, who's starting and running a podcast and it figures out that that's the real reason like not just to promote your practice, but your real reason is, is to ask curious questions. They love it and their podcasts are popular.
Absolutely. Absolutely. And to echo what you were saying, I think it's always better to be a, uh, a learned it all than a uh, than a know it all. And on the note of a podcast, if we if you've just inspired a number of podcast creators, the only bit of advice I'd give to them is just stick with it. Right. Because there's a lot of like one, two, three podcast creators versus the ones that stick with it consistently over a long periods of time. I know we were talking about marketing, but I would I would argue that today a podcast might be one of the best things you can do. I mean, one, you get you know, it's selfishly you get to learn from people that you just yeah. respect and you want to ask questions, but it's also an amazing content engine because just even from this podcast alone, we'll release the podcast, we'll release some like video bits and clips and then different quote cards and there'll be a blog post and all these things that are created just from this conversation. Yes. And you could do that if, if quote, the only thing you were doing was running a law firm, that like you could do all of that as well. It is just as valuable. But as you said, it is work. I mean, you have to carve out time, you get equipment. You have to either buy expertise or learn about the podcast world and how do we get it published. But the marketing principle is how can I do something once and create material to be used in different media at different times for different reasons? And that applies whether we're doing Yellow Page ad back in the day, podcasts, a website. Uh, writing an article, writing a letter to the editor of the Virginia State Bar Journal, and then using that letter as material out to other lawyers in the world. And the entrepreneurs think, do something once and use it 25 times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing I, I want to ask you about is just what's interesting. We just did a podcast about this where we had a listener actually ask the question of, well, what works in marketing? Like, what should I do for my law firm? And my answer was, well, everything works and then nothing works. And, and I just get the sense that many law firm owners are looking for that thing. Right. So whatever it is at the given time, like maybe right now it's TikTok. Then, you know, then before uh -huh. it was Google My Business, then, you know, then it was SEO and then it's social media or, or whatever it is. And my thought is all these things work for someone and all these things can not work for somebody else. And the message is much more important and reaching your audience is, is much more important. But what are your thoughts on in terms of just over the years, you've been in the game a long time, just in general, the type of marketing that works versus the type that doesn't. So our most successful members get good at one or two or three things. So we have people who mail print. I've been a huge proponent of print newsletters forever. And we have lawyers that mailing 30 and 40,000 issues a month. Well, that would make a lot of lawyers gag, right? Until you find out that you know, they have referrals from newsletters by March that pay for the whole thing for the whole year. So they get good at. So whether it's creating video, whether it's creating books and white papers, whether it's having a podcast, they actually, Michael, they don't try to do everything, but they try to do whatever it is with excellence. So if we're going to create, just say, uh, pay-per-click advertising, all right, I need a landing page. Right. It's not just the ad. It's where do they go? What do they see? Can I test video versus headline versus offer? You know, they study the great landing page builders of the world. And then they, they know the thing that they get good at is tracking. So if I'm going to do pick a media or pick a tool or a strategy as best I can, and it's not always perfect, of course, as best I can, if I send a dollar out, how do I know how many dollars that's bringing back versus the lawyer who tries this for a month, tries this for a month, tries this for a month, gets frustrated and pissed off at everybody because nothing, quote, worked. But he or she didn't take the time, even, even if you're going to outsource the work, okay? So I hire Chris to do a video. I have to be engaged enough to know what's the messaging I want, which is why your whole process or part of your process is let's find out about the law firm. What's Ben trying to accomplish? Who's the client he's trying to attract? That's really important. Whoever your media partner is, whoever your marketing partners are, you need to be a partner. This cannot be a one way street. Yep. And you have to know your audience, your client base, what you want, all of these different things, which is why I see a lot of firms, they just, they get started with marketing, right? And then they start thinking, hey, you know, we really should have thought about what our messaging was going to be or what our value proposition would be. And it, and it helps yeah. if you think about that up front, because if you're going to invest the dollars later on, it's just important that you're aligned on that. It is. You know, and one of the issues, you, you go to something like I just came back from National Trial Lawyers event in Miami and you see a lot of good stuff and the speakers on the stage are awesome and they're doing a lot of different things. And you come back, and you're like, oh, my gosh, like there was a, one speaker who talked about uh, boosting a TikTok video and paying 50K, like 50K to boost a vi TikTok video. Oh, my gosh. Like, how could that be? Well, yeah, that was a tiny part of his whole annual marketing spend. But you see this and now you think I got to be a TikTok expert. That stuff drives me crazy because... That's not me. It's not who I'm trying to attract. 
I got youngins who I guess can do some of that stuff for us. But it's really getting distracted because because you're right. You, if you haven't given deep thought to what's a practice you want, what's a life you want, who's a client you want, because you got to get those answers firm in your head first before you send out the media bait to go to attract them to you. And most lawyers skip that because they're busy. No one's ever told them that they should do. They should think this way. Law school didn't. The profession doesn't. And I'm too busy to go to a crisp event or Ben Glass, you know, great legal marketing event. Okay, but stop complaining. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, so Ben, this is I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you this. But as the father of nine children, how do you do it? And I mean, obviously, giving credit to your wife as well. But how do you make sure that you're making time? You're prioritizing between the law firm, great legal marketing, being a referee, CrossFit, being a great dad. So different stages of our life. So our youngest is 21 now. We've got seven grandkids and not perfect by any ways. But I'll tell you, as you know, you know, we've got four adopted from China, a couple with pretty significant special needs and early childhood trauma. And Sandy and I learned so much about the brain and so much about communication that our own communication skills with each other were greatly enhanced learning through seeking out experts to help parent our children. And so... I would say if you had to look for one key, it's with your spouse or partner being willing to engage in open and honest conversation, listen to each other, try to understand why the other feels or says what he or she does, and being unafraid to to also tell how you feel. And the language Sandy and I use sometimes with each other is, hey, when you say this, the story I'm telling myself is this inside. That's from Brene Brown. And we've become braver and more courageous about saying that to each other when times are tough or one of us gets tired and, you know, we get angry with each other. That's how you do it. Because if mom and dad or, you know, whatever this, the parental relationship is, aren't aligned, everything else is a lot harder. The second thing is just be present. Like, you know, I go to these soccer games and the parents are on the sideline and they'll have their heads in their damn phones. Like, really? Like, come on. For an hour, couldn't you watch Johnny play baseball or soccer or football or the dance recital or any of that stuff? Be present and ask your kids curious questions. Like, how was it? Like, I enjoyed watching you. It's not, again, it's not rocket science. I think the civilization may just fade away because the electronic drug, as I, it was referred to in a, in a book I read recently, I think it's called Dopamine World. It's a great book. And we have to resist that. Just for example, I have no email, Facebook, nothing. I have direct messenger on here. So my kids and wife can get a hold of me. I'm, I'm for, for those who are listening, I'm holding up my iPhone. I've not in 25 years taken an unplanned uh, inbound phone call. Everything is by appointment. Um, I, I've worked very hard with my team to, to get it. So things are scheduled for me and I'm fully briefed before I have the meeting. And you can do this. Like nobody dies because Ben doesn't have any email or social media on his cell phone. For me, that's been game changer because it, it, it helps clear my mind. I'm not as reactive as I used to be. Like if you're responding to every time your phone vibrates or dings, that's bad for your brain. It's bad for your heart too, I think. And 100% this is possible. Like those lawyers who are tied to their work life via their electronic device are killing themselves. Even the experience you and I had, I remember we were messaging about the podcast. You asked me a question about a conference. I think it was on a Friday. And at first I thought, man, I hope Ben doesn't judge me because I didn't respond until I think the following Monday. And it was just because our daughter was having a birthday party. We, yeah. we, we were spending some time on the weekend and it's fine. And the, when the world continued and, <laughs> and here we are, it's all good. Yeah. So your question, like, like, how do you do it? Well, A, be present, but B, I think it does take at least two people. If you're going to raise a family, like it's really hard to do it solo. Hats off to solo parents, because even when you're exhausted, you still have to be there. When you're a dual role and knowing when the other is tired and saying, like, I'm going to take over and just having these conversations that are like, tell me how I'm doing. Like, how am I as spouse and dad? And that's a serious question. What could I do to improve? And then not being defensive. It's so easy to be defensive. Like, you need to do this better. Okay, well, you need to do this better. And that just ends up in a fight. And I'm sure you already realized this, but with the things we've been talking about, it seems like there's parallels between being a great athlete, with being a great parent, with being a great business leader. Because it's oh, it, it's the same way of, of seeking feedback, of being a student, right? Bringing humility, exercising courage, all of these things. To me, if anything, this seems like there's the parallel between living a great life. 
Yeah, I, I think that you're right. And, I, and what I would say, it's the filter that you view life through. Like, I'm blessed, as I was saying to my siblings when we gathered the other day, we're blessed to, to have been born to who we were born to, where we were born in the United States, in Northern Virginia, at the time that we were born. We're very fortunate. We do not take that for granted. I don't think I owe anybody for that. It's not like I owe, I owe society, but I am blessed and grateful for that. And to the extent that I have any developed any skills or leadership qualities or whatever, I'm happy to share it. But I'm willing to work with anybody who will go and take action. I don't like to have my time wasted. But people who are curious, Michael, as you, you probably know, like I'm a personal injury lawyer in Fairfax, Virginia. I will show all of my stuff to any personal injury lawyer in Fairfax, Virginia. If you're curious, I'll show you everything I do. The reality is... I do so much that it may exhaust you, and I do it pretty well. But I'll share with you. Like I don't care. Look, the world is big. Like I don't. I don't have secrets. I don't think, and I'm happy to to share that. I don't want my time wasted. I love it. So, Ben, as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney Podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? Oh, for me personally, being a game changer means trying to change the profession, trying to change the default in the profession to one of happiness and joy. Because I believe that when the lawyer is happy and joyful and prosperous, that the clients will be well served. At the end of the day, we chose this profession because we do want to serve clients, right? And there's this huge gap between lawyers and the need for legal services. I think the elite in the profession get in the way of that with their rules and regulations and their narrow mindedness about things like you and I teach. I literally am trying to change the legal profession. And I do that by aligning with people like you, other thought leaders, like these people are, can have a significant impact. I want to align myself with them. I want to do whatever I can to support my friends because I think that we can change, Professor. We can change it from the default of sadness and depression. This should be joyful. Like, like we're not schlepping heavy bricks. We're not, I look outside the FedEx guy, it's 42 degrees, it's raining here, right? FedEx guy, is, I see him, he's bringing the big packages. Like that's hard work. We get to work in air conditioned and heated buildings, but that's a game changer for me. Like, let's let's change the world. I wanna give a huge thank you to Ben Glass for taking the time to speak with us today. And I wanna thank you, yes you, for listening to this podcast and for your commitment to learning and growing as a leader. If you found this episode valuable, here are three free ways that I can help you grow your law firm. Number one, download the first chapter of my book absolutely free at GameChangingAttorney.com. Number two, you can shoot me a text at 404-531-7691 and I'll answer any question that you've got for me. And finally, number three, if you can leave this podcast a five-star review, it'll help us gain access to more influential thought leaders and bring their lessons learned here to you. For more information on our interview with Ben Glass, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit GameChangingAttorney.com.